All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as I was stating uh, just before, I think a few people walked in today, today's panel will be modified. Uh, we were anticipating two other panelists. Uh, our assembly member is not able to join us through, due to medical uh, concerns, and our other panelist may or may not be able to uh, join us by phone. But we are so glad to have you here because uh, myself and Denise believe that this is one of the most important topics that we can tackle as a field in affordable housing. So with that, let me kick off this morning's session. So my name is Tanua Thrash Intuk, serving as Senior Executive uh, Director for the Local Initiative Support Corporation in Los Angeles. Today's panel is really about looking at what we can do to not only address the escalating affordable housing crisis, but how do we deploy resources in such a way that we are able to break the cycle of poverty and create levels of opportunity for both residents as well as small businesses in the deployment of those resources. The background, uh, just so you know how we'll uh, host today's session, and we may end early depending on uh, how Denise and I um, decide to proceed, but we know that affordable housing development resources have gone primarily to white-led firms across the state at a rate that is disproportionate to the state's racial and ethnic diversity. Over the years, this has resulted in diverse firms losing out on billions of dollars in potential contracts. This morning, I'm gonna start out with a brief presentation that really talks about the causes and consequences of the lack of supplier diversity and potential solutions uh, for, affordable, for the affordable housing field. Then I'll bring in our panelists, whoever is here and available, to really begin to discuss how do we increase diversity in the affordable housing supply chain? How do we track supplier diversity on our projects? How do we build up networks and capacity among the contractors so that we can get that done. I'll just say that some of you who are in the Southern California area know and have heard uh, from myself as well as Denise. Denise has served on the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housers. And in 2020, at the time of our racial awakening as a country um, and as a really as a nation and community, we talked about what role could the affordable housing community really play in making sure that we weren't perpetuating similar systems and structures. So that sounded like it was going to have an emergency announcement following it. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, I, there is nothing that's going to stop us from getting into this conversation. <laughs> no panelists. We said, Denise and I said, the show must go on. We will continue. So uh, let me walk you through uh, a presentation that has also uh, been utilized as part of a report uh, and position paper that I produced as of yesterday, and we'll make sure we take you directly to that. So let's talk about diversifying the affordable housing supply chain. Just for context, wanted to make sure that everyone in the room was aware of who LISC is. The Local Initiative Support Corporation works together with residents and community leaders and partners to forge resilient communities of uh, inclusive opportunity. We do that work uh, all across the United States. We have four offices here in the state of California, Bay Area, Rural, Los Angeles, and San Diego. We look to create great places to live, work, do business, and raise a family. So let's talk a little bit about the background of the issue that we have before us. Systematic racism has prevented people of color from thriving economically. Here are some examples of what some of those disproportionate impacts are. Research has shown that two and three cost burden Californians when it comes to rent are people of color and home ownership rates. We heard uh, Tina Johnson Hall talking about this uh, at the plenary yesterday. Home ownership rates are the lowest among Black and Latinx Californians. As a matter of fact, uh, studies have shown that Black home ownership rates have not moved upward in more than 50 years. So it still hovers in the very low 40%. And that is in comparison to the average white family that uh, home ownership rates are around 70% nationally, as pretty close to that as well here in California. 
Without having access to home ownership, as you can imagine, that stifles growth in business, that also uh, leads to challenges around being housed stably and could potentially lead to homelessness. There's income and wealth inequality. Many of you have heard uh, about those terms. Uh, you've seen the term probably most recently, 10X. Uh, the average black family has uh, 10 less times the amount of wealth as the average white family. Residential segregation has been part of that, valuation of homes, how much equity your home and value, discriminatory housing policies and practices have, have um, really deprived these communities from being able to develop wealth. And there's an underrepresentation in the construction industry among black workers, the, kinds of, the kind of industry that is able to take on workers from a variety of skill levels um, that are needed in the black community, for example. Uh, about 6% of construction workers are in the, the construction industry workers are black and not enough is being done to make sure that we increase that number so that we can receive and really focus on full employment for the black community. So many of you know the statistics, but it uh, bears worth repeating for those of you who may not uh, be aware. Whatever typically the national unemployment rate is as a nation, uh, the black community experiences at twice the amount at every point in our history. So we have an opportunity to increase the number of affordable housing units and advance economic opportunity at the same time. Um, this conversation is all about the fact that all of us here are looking to try and figure out how we can uh, disrupt homelessness, disrupt the uh, fact that so many people in our communities are spending so much money uh, on rent and on housing. Um, but I do believe that there is a connection with economic opportunity for our communities as well as we uh, strive for that. California continues to face escalating affordable housing crisis, as we've talked about, primarily related to a shortage in housing. But the state is investing more in development, um, but we also know that these resources typically go to firms that do not make up the racial and ethnic diversity that we have in our state. And we believe that nurturing diverse development related suppliers um, is crucial to increasing uh, housing construction and to making sure that we've got a pipeline of firms uh, that can really be part of helping to build that housing. So we believe in this concept of just growth through housing development. The industry, we believe, as an affordable housing industry, can use its access to tried and true financing sources. We know that building affordable housing is highly regulated. Um, there are very few um, places within the development of affordable housing that aren't um, pretty secure, uh, you know, financing uh, structures and tools. And so this is an opportunity then to introduce, we believe, BIPOC owned and led firms to be part of that supply chain. We want to open up access to inclusive procurement policies and practices among developers. And we understand that there is a need to build capacity among those diverse firms so that they can, in turn, take advantage of these opportunities. So let's talk just a little bit about what slice of the pie could potentially be available. So over the last um, between 2015 and 2020, this is the latest data that we have at the moment, about 123,000 units were produced utilizing the LIHTC uh, financing tool here in the state of California. $52 billion in resources uh, were utilized in order to make that happen. And you can see while there is some variation in trends year over year, generally we've had an upswing in terms of the number of units that are produced and the uh, amount of dollars that it takes in order to get that done. This next slide is all about, well, where did those dollars get spent? How much of those dollars are available for discretionary? You can choose as a developer. The visual here, while you may not be able to see all the details, the color bands here really help you get a sense of where those dollars go. The green represents land. 
So that is by and large static and probably have a lot less control over where those dollars go because as affordable housing developers, we're looking for any available land and opportunity uh, to go ahead and uh, build upon to create affordable housing. You'll see at the very top, the little gray band, that represents a lot of our soft costs, architects, engineers, um, some of the other consultants that are part of the project. We have a little, we have a lot more uh, discretionary sort of authority about who works on a particular project. The black band represents the developer fee. Generally, I say we leave that alone. We want developers to be interested in doing this work. The blue represents financing. And so there's costs associated, we all know, with taking out the various loans and uh, various other tools that we have to in order to get this done. But the purple, you can see that the purple uh, all across the state, um, and for our friends that are in Orange County, we know that that's not broken out there. It's included in Southern, in the uh, sort of LA uh, area. But the purple band, as you can see, represents at it, you know, in every jurisdiction, no less than 60% of the total amount of uh, resources that are going to a discretionary source, which is construction. Um, and so as affordable housing developers, you know, upwards of 60, 70 plus percent of the resources that we're investing in the development of affordable housing is invested in such a way that we have some discretionary authority as to where those resources go. So this slide is really all about the fact that it's summing up this concept. There are billions of dollars in procurement opportunities that are created on an annual basis and more in the production of affordable housing. Many of our developers have discretion over who they choose to participate in a development. As a matter of fact, in a study um, that we did in partnership with SCAMP and others such as Denise, uh, we found that developers are interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion policies, but only 33% were tracking contractor diversity on their projects, and none of the organizations that were surveyed had any explicit goals uh, to make sure that they were setting, hitting, achieving, exceeding goals associated with um, supply chain diversity. And part of where um, this concept comes from for me, I've had history of working with a government um, issued um, order called GO 156. Some of you may be familiar, but in the Public Utilities uh, Commission purview, this GO 156 encourages, asks all those entities that are regulated by the California PUC to share their supplier diversity numbers, goals, outreach accordingly. Again, it's voluntary. Um, the history of it is that all of the regulated entities under the PUC um, have gone ahead and shared, and they share it on an annual basis. Um, and frankly, none of them want to be in last place uh, when it comes to what their uh, actual uh, reports are and, and what they report regarding spending with diverse firms, women-owned firms, LGBTQIA firms uh, accordingly. And so that kind of sunshine has really encouraged them to think and to put into place programs and strategies to try and reach more diverse firms. So we've taken some cues from that legislation in order to put forth a piece of legislation here in California that I'll talk about, which is AB 2873. We want to thank Assemblymember uh, Joan Sawyer, who is authoring this uh, on our behalf. This particular bill, which we're calling a sunshine uh, bill, would require TCAC awardees to submit project level supplier information to keep TCAC when you apply uh, for your applications for LIHTC. The metrics right now would include um, looking at race, ethnicity, gender, location and census track, um, targeting uh, firms that are located in LMI neighborhoods and community in hopes that they are also hiring um, from those communities as well. We have chatted with some developers who are also very interested in learning more about the demographics and or background of the workers on some of their projects. And so that's something that we are looking to come back to to try and refine if we can in this iteration, if not in future iterations. This bill would require TCAC to make this information publicly available uh, on an annual basis to be able to share and um, 
we as the field um, can work on some analysis of that. And developers would self-certify this information. We've been talking with TCAC about um, sort of what they would consider the burden of having to audit every uh, file regarding this. However, we are looking at uh, some um, spot audits uh, so that developers on an annual basis, anyone could be selected uh, for uh, an audit to better understand how they came to the conclusion regarding the numbers and the submission um, that they submitted to TCAC. So the first uh, concept here is we want to collect the data. We want to understand from a baseline perspective what's happening in the field right now. What are people doing sort of more naturally? Um, and if we can get that information, we believe that in the future we can build on AB 2873. Building on that would mean two additional concepts we'd love to see uh, come forth. We'd want to provide incentives to those who are doing great uh, with meeting and exceeding their goals. And we wanna provide funding so that there is support for those diverse firms and networks uh, that we'll be looking for in order to help them access some of these opportunities. So when it comes to incentives, we'd love to be able to look at a system that rewards developers with points, for example, in their application, if they explicitly set the goals and then exceed or meet those goals. We'd love to make sure that it was implemented not only through TCAC, but to see how we could also look at other HCD uh, programs and would encourage this kind of activity at the local level, cities and counties who also have uh, resources as well, um, to take a look at how this um, information could help them set goals and potentially also incentivize um, the use of um, that data in meeting and exceeding DEI goals. And then finally, earmarking resources that funding, making funding available to support the networks and capacity building of diverse uh, entrepreneurs and companies so that they can work on larger projects, more complicated projects, union um, funded projects. Uh, we understand based on talking with a number of contractors that this is an area where they could use some additional resources. This is also a great opportunity to create peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support. And uh, at List Los Angeles, we have been able to prepare, for example, diverse entrepreneurs through um, a cohort-based program that we have to help them really focus on winning um, contracts in this kind of arena. I'm very proud to say that as of yesterday, um, if you'd like to uh, go ahead and uh, use the uh, QR code here, you'll be directed to a report um, that I authored, a position paper that outlines uh, why this is important, the background uh, on this topic, and goes into more detail regarding some of the slides that I've presented here. It's called Improving Subcontractor Diversity in California's Affordable Housing Development. I'll wait one more moment while those in the room are able to capture this. Okay. And with that, we'll turn now to our panelists. But if you are as excited as I am uh, about uh, what has been presented here, we'll happily stop and wait for an applause. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me head on over. <laughs> I just realized my name's not on the slide. <laughs> I now have to be a panelist as well. Um, so let me introduce uh, our panelist that we have for today. Um, we have Denise Wint. Uh, Denise is a wonderful friend and colleague and someone I've known for many, many years in the affordable housing space and in general. She's the Vice President of Real Estate Development at EAH Housing. I hope I got that right, Denise, because yes. you keep getting promoted, so I wanted to make sure. <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> That's right. I'll get another promotion soon. Denise joined EAH in 2018 after serving as the Director of Projects and Services for Innovative Housing Opportunities. 
Denise has used her leadership roles to elevate the conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion in affordable housing development, both internally at EAH Housing and externally in the industry. She has led an ongoing workshop series for SCAMP to discuss how affordable housing developers can center inclusion in the development and construction process. Denise strives to expand opportunities for bidding on construction projects for BIPOC-led third-party vendors who are underrepresented in the affordable housing industry. Thank you so much for being here, Denise. Thank you, Tamia. Um, I think I've mentioned to everyone else, but just for your reference, we also were to be joined by Drexel Johnson. He has participated with us before. He's the founder and executive director of the Young Black Contractors Association. Uh, he is quite on site all the time, so we have a hard time uh, pinning him down, uh, but thanked him for his input into uh, the moving of this position paper as well as legislation. And we had hoped to be joined by Assembly Member Reggie Jones Sawyer, who represents constituents in the 59th District in the Los Angeles area. Uh, he believes that we want, should have more safeguards for working families. Um, as well as job creation policies and more affordable housing. And so was very pleased uh, to stand with us in authoring this legislation uh, going forward. So with that, Denise, first, let's just, since it's just you and I, um, any initial comments or thoughts that you just wanna get started with um, to bring your voice into the conversation? And then I'll go through some of the questions we have. Well. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to Nua for continuing the conversation. It is important, and I appreciate the fact that it's not, it has not just been a one-time conversation. It's a continual process. We're learning, we're growing, and we've invited so many people into this conversation, and I'm happy to see that it's going even further than I ever imagined, because it simply started out of a conversation amongst other developers in LA County saying, hey, have you heard of what's going on and somebody's talking about not having enough representation of black contractors or subs on our development and it just took off from there. So to see almost two years later that we're still having this conversation and seeing where it's been going, I'm I'm encouraged. Yeah, so the what you speak of is that um, there was a project that was actually going up in Los Angeles um, and it was real clear that there were not enough or really any diverse people working on the project, and yet the project was located uh, in, in South LA, LA yeah. uh, in a community that is diverse, um, and people in that neighborhood were like, you know, there's no one here that looks like me, and why is that? Mm -hmm. um, and it's so, you know, wonderful to know that you and other colleagues took that conversation to heart and said, well, what can I do about it um, in my role accordingly? Um, so, Denise, you are in a position of really authority, Vice President of Real Estate Development over at EHA, EAH. Um, so why is diversity, equity, and inclusion in project labor so important to you and to EAH? Well, I could say it's important because EAH works throughout the state of California and Hawaii. And being able to represent or have individuals who are representing these developments that we're working on in the various communities are critical. There is a sense of trust. People can relate, identify, understand a little bit of what's going on in these neighborhoods and communities. And oftentimes it doesn't seem as if it's the big developer coming in and taking over. And if we do, and you know, of course, being in affordable housing development, we are the big developer coming to take over and change things in different com in ways that communities do not appreciate, even though we know there's a long term benefit. But I think having that representation across the board is important. So if you see our team alone, we can have anybody in our team go to the various communities and have that level of comfortability. And so being able to you know, further hear the numbers that Tanua presented earlier, you can see that the wealth gap is so huge. You don't have to be in the affordable housing space to understand. And if we can be able to transfer that over into various communities, then we could see a lot more investment going back into these different, in these areas that we develop in. Oftentimes we'll concentrate affordable housing in certain areas because it may be easier to develop, but there's not an economic advantage that is 
afforded in those areas. Just being able to have access to high quality grocery, having access to just family restaurants. When we hear that often, when we go into these communities, we're like, well, they're not gonna come because you guys are considered a low income neighborhood. So I think that all goes hand in hand outside of the edifice that we're focusing on. So uh, one of the, so I'm gonna serve as both a panelist as well as facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> it, so that's great, Denise. And if I were answering that question, <laughs> how would you answer that, Tanua? Yeah, I, <laughs> I I think of it too from, and and this is what we go into in the paper. This idea that um, you know a whole community or a whole person, the housing is a piece of it, but people need jobs because mm -hmm. they've got to be able to sustain that housing and sustain the amenities um, that we want to see in those communities. And we know that uh, diverse owned firms are much more likely to hire diverse people uh, in those communities. So them having access to those contracts really starts to chip away not only at the racial wealth gap for that individual owner or owners, it also um, really chips away at the unemployment that communities are experiencing um, as well. So, and then I, um, I like to think about um, this is, really important uh, in terms of uh, you know the, uh, the sheer volume of resources that we have as a field mm -hmm. and what we're advocating for. I mean, there are not only are there state resources now, uh, local jurisdictions are passing local bond measures and other measures that are putting resources into affordable housing. Um, and part of what we want to um, you know, disrupt is, I. for me, success is not seeing a mother think about whether her child is gonna get access to a voucher or to an affordable housing unit. Mm -hmm. We wanna disrupt that poverty. And so having access to meaningful economic opportunity gives communities a way to think about a way of having self, um, uh, you know, being able to, to, to self-support uh, without hope of, fully having to uh, rely on mm -hmm. the system of uh, a rental affordable housing unit. Right. So uh, does somebody want to clap on that? <laughs> uh, yeah. If you haven't noticed, we appreciate the interactive. Oh, <laughs> yes. And, and let, let me, I'm going to ask, mm -hmm. we're going to uh, go through a couple more questions, but we certainly are going to open it up to you as well if you have questions um, before we continue on with others. So what can people do? <laughs> Uh, Denise, you know, what are the internal processes developers can adopt to diversify those contractors that work on their development projects? Everybody here is ready. They've gotten, you know, they know why we need to do it and why it's important, but how do they do that? How do they get that done? Well, I think a lot of it depends on where the organization is internally. So if they understand, yes, we need to do something, oftentimes is well, what do we need to do next or who can help us? So I think it just starts with that initial assessment. And with the community that we are in as a whole, it's very easy to just reach out. As Tanu had mentioned, just with the SCAMP in Southern California, we have a network of affordable housing developers and it's just, the question is, well, what are you doing? What are you, what conversations are you having with your board? What conversations are the leadership in your organ is the leadership in your organization having? What conversation is then happening amongst just the staff? How do we get that buy-in? Because I believe that's going to be one of the critical components. It's one thing to, for me at least, to say yes, this is what we're going to do. But if there isn't the buy-in from the rest of the team, it'll be it'll be difficult. And I could say that for just from personal experience as well where it's okay, well, we need to understand, well, what are our targets? So one thing that we have looked at internally is just, well, what are we doing right now? Have we been exceeding these numbers? We don't wanna just throw out an arbitrary, we're, we're gonna make sure that 10% of all of our contracts go to a BIPOC um, contractor or vendor. Have we already, who have we been reaching out to and been working with and over the course of the 50 years that EH has been in operations. I mean, it started out of the, because of the assassination of Dr. Reverend Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. And so we understand that housing is part of that social justice movement, but be, again, going beyond that. So I think it starts with that initial conversation. 
And then there are organizations that said, okay, we're committed to this. We've had the conversation for a long time. We need to start implementing. Maybe it is just starting out with that 10%. We'll just target the 10% and see how that goes. How specific do we need to get with our target? Are we breaking, are we just saying minority owned business and women owned business? Or are we saying going down a little bit deeper where we're then taking that 10% and saying it must be black led organization or Latinx led organization or Native Hawaiian led organizations. And so I think it's, I think it just starts right now with just the initial initial assessment. If you say, yes, I'm ready to go, reach out to other organizations and say, well, what are you doing? What have you implemented? Is there uh, reference sheets or just your, what is your DEI statement that you have that we can copy and implement? And again, bringing the team in to support that cause. And that's just, just a little bit of it, but we've had a lot of conversations. So Tanua, what would you say to that? <laughs> okay, you can serve as facilitator too for that. You, you can ask me. Um, so there's, there's so much more to unpack there, and I bet people have some other specific questions. You talked about the board. Um, that certainly, that is a really critical place um, for organizations, especially nonprofits, to go because it has to be part of, and I loved how you talked about having a DEI statement. You know, who are you as an organization and why is this important to you as an organization? And being able to name that and talk about that and state that, because uh, you also, we hope, are attracting board members and staff members who can, uh, you know, see that, understand that, and then want to be a part of that. Um, I want group, I want organizations to know that um, this is not something you should think that you have to do on your own. Right. Um, this is new work um, for us as a field. It's not something that maybe organizations have core competencies to do. You may not have a staff person or a leader or a set of board members or a board leader that's comfortable with this. And so you may need to have um, external support mm -hmm. in order to make that happen. So this is not something that organizations should feel like we should know how to do because it's 2022. Um, that's not the case. And part of what I'm hoping that the position paper, this conversation, the legislation will do is really bring philanthropy to the table because mm -hmm. we need support um, for organizations to do this work you've got to carve out the time. You've got to have someone who's dedicated and committed to it internally, externally. Um, you've got to, it, it's not a one size fit all, right? People are in different regions of the state. What DNI means in terms of percentage in one part of the state may not mean the same thing in other parts of the state. Um, or you may have specific populations that are unique to where you are in the state where you probably will have a higher number um, just because of where you're located. Um, and so we wanna take that into account. It's not one size fit all. So I'm really hopeful that we can bring philanthropy to the table and start to create cohorts and conversations, get some consulting dollars to organizations that are ready uh, to do this work and want to be part of um, setting those, those goals, putting those statements together, um, and reporting, you know, to the board on a regular basis about, um, you know, what's happening in that arena. So let's dig a little deeper. And uh, I would also say yes. to that, Tanua, and the feedback that you do receive internally, you reach out to your regional housing association, whether it's the CCRH, if you're rural housing, SCAMP, if you're in Southern California, Kennedy Commission, if you're in Orange County, um, San Diego, I mean, just throughout the various regions and 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 pH for Northern California, it's like they're all doing something. And so if there are more voices coming to them saying that we need help and we don't know where to start, well, we have started, what else should we be doing? Or how do I know if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Reach out and we can create and collaborate with these working groups. And then as to Nua's point, it's like, okay, these are the systems we need to put in place in order for people, for us to be successful. As a matter of fact, we've met with um, all of the regional associations regarding this concept. 
um, enthusiastic support um, from all of them, and many of them are looking for more opportunities to come before their membership and members like you uh, to talk about this and to see um, where their region wants to go on these topics. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the efforts that you have put in place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and feel free to bring in uh, other colleagues who you are aware and some of their stories. So at EAH, um, you're committed to DEI. You started to adopt a policy where you are internally deciding on your own. You're, you know, you're looking at what are you doing right now. Mm -hmm. And now that you've started doing that, what have been some of the results? Have you been able to increase your pool of diverse contractors? What What have been some early uh, successes from that work? I think some of the early successes has been this DEI statement. It, it's intentional, and it breaks down not only just from a vendor standpoint and the board standpoint, but staff. What kind of conversations do we need to have internally amongst our staff to even just understand what challenges some people may go through or what some of the microaggressions may be? So it just even further expanded the conversations. And so then I think once we have that foundation established, it can help solidify the why behind this effort as far as including a diverse pool of contractors and subcontractors because it is now okay i see how this has affected me what else can i do for my community or how else can i bring those conversations in as far as the vendor i think we're still working through that process but at least now one other component that we've added is like hey there's this simple component added into our vending system that we can just click the box it's not a it's not a mandatory require it's not a requirement for our vendors to select but at least we can inform folks that hey we want to know what we're doing and doing well so could you please include on your form if you are an mbe or wbe or minority business enterprise or a woman-owned business enterprise also, we're having those deeper internal conversations when it comes to the, the contractor selection. What does that look like? Where are we building? What does their subcontractor pool look like? So those conversations are now being had during the interview process. Like, what is it that's going to happen? Does this need to be an addendum to our contract? So I would say the conversation has certainly evolved. And what I'm hearing from other developers is that, again, they have that percentage target the, the target proportions broken down specifically where they were able to act immediately and so I do appreciate that regardless of what size organization that you are that folks are still able to move along the way and I would love for us to be able to reconvene and see how the numbers have improved over the past year and a half or almost yeah year and a half since we started the conversation I think is it's time for us to go back and reflect so Denise, I recall when we had one of our SCAMP um, meetings and you had invited a general contractor or someone who's like a consultant to general contractors onto our conversation. And can you, can you recall that conversation? You wanna, I'd, I'd love for people to get a sense as to how general contractors are responding to this kind of request mm -hmm. uh, from developers. Um, and what are some of the arguments that we're hearing and what have been some of the responses that we have given regarding why this is so important? I would say it's been across the board. We have some that are very supportive and we're excited and saying, you know, this is what we've been doing for all these years and it's just something we didn't necessarily broadcast. <laughs> you know, I've been on boards or we have mentorship programs or it's a conversation again that we have where we certainly try to be intentional about our efforts and our outreach. Other organisms, some other GC said, we didn't even know. I remember one in particular is like, I didn't even know what DE and I stood for, but it's good to know that we have been working with these contractors for all of these years. So we have been doing it, but it's just been a part of their culture. Other comments I've heard was just that, we don't know where they are. How do we know where they are? or we've done our best effort to outreach and it could be just a post on a flyer of a flyer on the job site and we did our best effort or it's been well we have a lot of people of color working on our jobs and they're the laborers but we're saying no these we're looking at the folks 
who get these contracts outside of just being the security on site that may be a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar contract. Where are these? So who are you reaching? So the converse, the the comments have been been interesting and eye opening for sure. But they've been all been honest, and I think it's because of the relationships that we formed in various levels where we can have those. Um, we folks are feel safe enough to to shed that light. But again, it was it was enlightening. So that starts to get us into and if there's audience uh, questions after this question, I'll certainly uh, entertain oh, other, other those. Um, but let's talk. I, I wanted to get into the challenges, but go ahead. Yeah. So another challenge had been. Um, well, if we a couple of them, so if we do hire these minority contracts, like I don't want the, the quality of the work to to diminish and that one was a hard one because I said just because you're targeting so a black contractor or any other contractor that means the quality of work would diminish. like why why would you believe that to be true so again it goes to have a deeper conversation and then the other ones have been where we can target but the resources available to these smaller contracting firms is not available or are, are not available it costs money to be able to provide estimates and they don't have that resource to be able to provide that. Is there something that we can initiate in order for them to have those opportunities? We have some of these contracts where we need to turn bids around in a few weeks, six weeks, and they just don't have the capacity. So it's just easier to go with the people that we've been working with. So, you know, we would love to be able to, but it's, the timing may not work as well. So those have been some other challenges. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That was going to be on my list. So part of, as you can imagine, conversations that um, I had to have as part of the position paper and the legislation, that when the one you came back to popped up quite a bit, and that was, well, you know, these are very big projects. Uh, my reputation is on the line as a developer. I don't feel comfortable extending an opportunity to someone that, and the, you know, people don't want to say it, but they, you know, I, I don't know, and just automatically assuming that the quality mm -hmm. is not there because the request is that this that there be diverse firms. So that's something that we have to really try and figure out how to overcome. Mm -hmm. Part of why you also heard me talk about, uh, especially when it comes to affordable housing development, the level of regulation, the requirements that we have as a field, um, the, the double opportunity there is that, uh, not that there's a fail proof, but there are things that we can ask for from our vendors and contractors that are required as part of the process that help with mitigating some of that risk. Um, but of course, yes, that also means that those firms have to be in a position mm -hmm. to be able to respond to that level of regulation and scrutiny and requirements because of the heavy regulation. And on the other end, that's part of why we also want to be able to really um, elevate the resources accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about not being able to respond as quickly to bidding estimates. Um, other challenges we hear as well as around financing and the ability um, to get the bonding that is needed for right. the level and scale of projects that we're developing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another uh, area where we're seeing uh, some challenges. Uh, we also, I've also heard um, and seen from uh, contractors, uh, especially diverse contractors, they are not union shops. Mm -hmm. And for some of the projects that many of us are developing, depending on whether we get local funds or certain state funds, there is a requirement um, that there is uh, union workers and some of those, uh, the smaller um, entities and diverse led firms don't have that background or need to be able to track prevailing wages. Mm -hmm. And so having the resources um, as an organization to do that um, is difficult for some of the firms. Again, this is why that third area around funding and capacity building is so important. Mm -hmm. But then I had a really interesting conversation with one of the regional associations. I won't say which one, um, but the interesting conversation was that that regional association had done some research. And what they found was that, and oftentimes for uh, developers, um, they really, there, there really isn't choice in terms of who you are selecting 
to bid on your projects. There isn't choice because of the narrow definitions of what's needed, the time frame, the cost of this, the uh, capacity um, that's needed. And so what's happening is those projects that have a requirement for prevailing wage or union work or certain kind of turnaround, certain kind of pricing, there's only two, three firms that can actually bid on that. Mm -hmm. And those two, three firms then set for the entire region and potentially for the state, the price. Yeah. And part of what we are not getting as a field is more competitive pricing because we don't have as many options uh, in terms of who we can work with given some of those regulatory requirements. Um, so when I think about what we're trying to do as well, not only are we trying to open up economic opportunity um, for those who need it most, but we really are trying to unlock ourselves from being um, sort of, you know, stuck into a very narrow box of groups that we can choose from who are setting prices mm -hmm. 100 times more than necessary because they know that they are the only options that groups yeah. have. Yeah. So uh, I saw some heads nod, and uh, we've got we, we've got a few more questions that we can ask ourselves. Um, <laughs> I would like to hear from <laughs> but we'd be happy to uh, take a moment to hear from the audience. We see a question here in the front. Yes, ma'am. We have a mic. We, a mic we, is yeah, we'll have a mic just so folks online can hear everyone. Hi. Thank you, moderators and panelists. Stand up. Um, Mike, actually, you kind of touched on my question, um, Tanua, with what you just talked about, because as I was kind of taking notes, you know, my big question is diving a little deeper into how requirements of prevailing wage and PLAs fit into this. And I know, I know you touched on it, but it, I guess the question is like, how is that conversation showing up at the policy level, right? Because if we are looking mm -hmm. at having developers reporting, those who are getting TCAC, and, and as we look at the state level, you know, so much of the legislation and the efforts to provide more housing funding or do CEQA streamlining are tying to PLAs and prevailing wage. So how, what are the thoughts yeah. about getting at, at what's a little bit of a conflict there with appreciable, understandable policy goals, but from an implementation perspective makes it hard. Right. So let me be clear, um, you know, I come from a union household. So there is uh, no interest in eliminating uh, project labor agreements or the associated union prevailing wages because those uh, represent, uh, you know, quality jobs and employment opportunities for families. Um, so that's something that we have shared with the building trades associated with this piece of legislation. Where we are coming at this is from the perspective of we need to increase the capacity of the number of firms that could be available to do that work um, so that we can get more competitive pricing, create that economic opportunity. So we wanna increase the pool of available uh, contractors that can do the work. And then on the other end, you heard us talk, you heard me talk a little bit about interest in increasing the number or at least taking an account of the workers on the site. Um, so we are also then interested in understanding uh, who has access to those quality jobs and what does that look like and put pressure on uh, unions accordingly to make sure that those jobs are available to the most diverse uh, folks possible and certainly reflective of whatever community uh, we're operating in. Thank you. We have a question in the back. There's a gentleman over there who had raised his hand for and others. We will get you in just a second. Honestly, I think that my questions have been answered, or maybe I don't want to ask it because I wanted to go before her. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, have you found or do you see when you're dealing with the contractors or subcontractors, are they, for lack of a better word, are they ready? And if you are finding that they are not ready, in our discussions, in your discussions, how do we help them get ready, so to speak? Do you follow me so much? Absolutely. Um, so I had mentioned uh, a cohort-based program that we've participated in, um, or that LISC has, has uh, put on, and that's called the Ascend Los Angeles program. It specifically takes those who are, the last cohort was all about the construction uh, industry, um, 
the participants in that program get a three-pronged approach. They take courses over at LMU's business school and the entrepreneurship under the dean and all the faculty there. Um, so they get an MBA um, in a matter of uh, a few weeks. Um, and then the second area is they get access to a consultant that then helps get them ready. You know, how do you bid? How do you be prepared? What do you need to do um, in order to make that happen? And then helps them actually with the bidding process. So a consultant that supports that. And then the third area is, um, is, is the capital, is the money. Um, and so making sure that they have the money that they need to successfully bid on and or uh, execute on those contracts. That is a highly, uh, as you can imagine, a, a project or a program that requires resources. Right, it requires a lot of resources in order to make that happen. Um, but we believe that that is one way to get uh, groups prepared um, for the opportunity to bid. Um, there may be some other opportunities that we can look at in terms of, you know, some peer opportunities, some subcontracting uh, with groups accordingly. The whole goal here is to start to get them into the pipeline, socialize them to what's happening uh, on our projects as affordable housing developers that have highly regulated uh, projects accordingly. Um, at some point, I would love for the state of California to earmark uh, some resources. And with the program that I just described, it would be fantastic if, again, we could get philanthropy to stand with us on that so that if you find those firms, you identify those, we have somewhere where they can go to be ready um, so that they can be successful going forward. Denise, do you have anything you want to add? No, that was great. Great. We've got some questions here. So you can take that one, and then we'll come over there and over here. Yeah, my question is brief, and it's uh, similar to the one that the woman in the front had. Um, I know in the last few years, uh, state building trades have been pushing for skilled and trained in streamlining legislation. Do you guys have a sense of how many um, of our BIPOC GCs would meet the definition of skilled and trained? I don't know that number, but I've been told, you know, just from the ones that we do know about, it could be difficult because if they do have to have this, um, I think there was something that someone had shared with me regarding the apprenticeship requirement, where they, you know, if we do identify a BIPOC sub and they haven't been part of the apprenticeship program even though they've been in the industry for 25 years that they wouldn't qualify so i've heard that but i don't know the number and and i think what you're describing for me is sort of the next level or layer of research that we want to do which is around what talking more about those challenges and barriers and then being able to identify what are some of those solutions Sir? Oh, yeah, I should stand up. Um, yeah, and congratulations on the bill. It's um, very common sense on ways it's not already a part of the state of California. Um, so that leads to this question, which is like at the state and local levels, what would you say are some low hanging fruit to increase construction, subcontractor, and builder diversity for all development? Um, yeah, outside of affordable housing. Yeah, outside of affordable housing. We had some initial conversation about uh, this bill and whether it should be expanded to include all. Um, and, and I think that it can get there at some point. Um, part of what we were trying to identify was what was going to be the trigger mechanism. Um, affordable housing, again, because it's so highly regulated, we knew that we could get interest from those who had to apply to TCAT because it's such an integral part of how so much of the affordable housing gets built. Um, but, you know, what you're asking for uh, is, is a movement of awareness, uh, a movement of uh, then beyond awareness, uh, a willingness to, to act, um, to educate and act. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm excited that you're interested in moving beyond affordable housing. We think that's where we need to go. Um, but it's, it's going to take a movement of awareness um, and education, I think, to get there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Sir? Hi, uh, Jared Nolan at uh, Eden Housing. So we've embarked on this process of trying to uh, kind of identify where, where we are with our diversity and then set goals. but 
something we've struggled with is how to kind of identify and define uh, these our, our vendors. Um, I know there's the minority owned enterprise, women owned enterprise, um, but uh, we're also concerned maybe uh, vendors aren't kind of aware of these designations or don't know how to qualify or don't have the um, the information or resources to. So are there other designations that you've looked at or are out there that we can also include or is that still kind of the best at this point? Um, you know, and knowing we're also interested in uh, diversity along you know LGBTQ um, dimensions as well. So um, just interested in your thoughts on that. Can we give him a round of applause? We want to thank Eden. Eden Housing, thank you. Um, so thank you for standing and saying that it's important to your organization that you um, have already taken the steps um, to initially understand what's happening in your vendor supply chain um, and that you are requesting and asking of your vendors and subs, uh, who are they doing business with? Mm -hmm. So um, yes, the, the question is, you know, who, how do you know uh, whether someone is or, or isn't? Um, there are um, various levels of certification that a business can get. Um, there are a lot of local level opportunities um, there. So meaning your local water department, your local utility, um, a local regional agency, there are you know, regional uh, small business development centers that offer this, certainly the state. Um, offers it as well. There are national entities that offer support. Um, what you're reminding me of now, is that something that maybe we can think about in terms of as we build this work out further, um, how do we help developers share with their vendors where they can get certified um, and where, where some of the more simpler or supportive places um, a business owner can go for that certification. Um, there's still and, and you know this this also you know depends on the level of resources you have available as an organization um, sometimes even a website check um, can give you some sense as to who is there and uh, yeah. information you know incorporation information from an organization along with that or some other you know documentation regarding uh, the organization can get you there so you're almost doing that um, on your own um, so that's, again, depending on what level of resources you have for that. But this also speaks to why we need more funding, because we've got to be able to identify, um, and those who don't have it, we want to help them to be able to access it, because not only will it help them with your project, but other projects as well. For the LGBTQIA uh, community, business community, there really aren't good places just yet to get that information. Um, the best I've been able to offer uh, at the moment is uh, whether they have an affiliation with a chamber, um, either locally, statewide, or otherwise. Um, and some of those uh, businesses do maintain active membership, and it's you know very clear that they're not just allies, but that they identify um, in that way. So that affiliation also helps. Thank you. I just learned some stuff too, so thanks for asking that question. <laughs> there was a, was there another hand up? Okay, we'll go over here and then we'll come back. She's she's coming with the mic, Miss Anderson. <laughs> Uh, this might be a question that's a little unfair for you guys, given your focus on California, but I'm wondering if you're aware of other states that have, you know, uh, similar requirements in order to, you know, secure tax credits or just might, what might be going on in other parts of the country. That is an excellent question. Um, as we've started talking about it here in California, people have been bringing to my attention other efforts across the country. So in New York, for example, they've been doing something like this for many years. Um, and so they have some tools that we were able to take a look at and utilize that in conversations with TCAC and others at the state of California regarding um, how they collect this information uh, from developers. Um, in conversations here at the conference, uh, met with some other colleagues who um, just shared with me some uh, other uh, affiliated uh, groups across the country that are doing something like this. So there appears to be, um, you know, maybe not as comprehensive, maybe not on the statewide level, but 
certainly there is interest in um, trying to diversify supply chain um, in affordable housing, but in development in general as well. So more to come. That's that's the third paper yeah. we could do, right? <laughs> Keep bringing up ideas. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. So we have a couple more questions, but we saw one here. I have another question. Um, I know when you're with the Sunshine Bill, I was just looking at what is going to be reported. And I mean, I totally understand the desire to have ownership, like firms that are owned by, you know, black owned firms, people of color, women getting the contracts. But is it also going to capture in the interim, noting that there needs to be capacity building to meet all the rules and requirements of prevailing wage and all that? Is there going to be some data? even to capture the makeup of the workforce, right? Because like one way to get people toward ownership is getting them into working for those firms, right? Mm -hmm. So they become ready to be owners and not all of us can come out of school and be like, I'm an owner. Uh, yeah. Is that part of it at all or? So um, the question is related to how do we um, capture the data on the workers? Um, because certainly in a number of black and brown communities in order to become an owner, you've got to apprentice some way or be part of the field. You may not be, you may or may not be part of a family that, you know, has a business and the legacy continues. Mm -hmm. We have been um, thinking about, um, there are some of the building trades have uh, already, they're nascent, but they do have programs to encourage some of their members to become business owners. Um, and so there, we, you know, we've kind of looked at and thought about, is there a way, um, because they will already have had experience with prevailing wage and unionized labor and work and connection with um, the folks who are making decisions about who works on a particular job, is there an opportunity to create a partnership with some of those trades such that um, to the extent that, that we identify uh, members among their ranks um, who are interested in entrepreneurship, resources can be put forth from both the union, other places as well to get them into ownership as opposed to um, you know, just being part of the, the union itself. So that's something that, again, that's, that's maybe paper number, maybe number five. <laughs> Yes, question over here, lady. Thank you. Thanks for the talk today. Um, when you mentioned philanthropy and how important it is in part of the overall solution, where do you see we playing the biggest role? And then go down, because obviously there's so many places along that continuum that we can support, but where do you see us really filling a gap or a hole? And do you see that being more of a, a part of that cohort, a part of this whole process where we can plug in, or is it really supporting the variety of organizations that make up that cohort? So I think there are probably two places right now um, to really be able to demonstrate um, success and opportunity. The first is we want to capitalize on those organizations that are ready to set their DEI statement, that are ready to do the work with their board that are ready to set the goals as an organization um, and then measure them. So that's one place. Let's, let's start with those organizations that are ready, willing, are raising their hands and want to demonstrate um, that they are committed to it and setting the goals. The other area would be in uh, really testing out um, the support that's needed for the diverse firms that are out there that with just a little additional support, expertise, uh, assistance, um, the quality of the work is there, but maybe the systems that may be needed to, uh, to be able to capture um, prevailing wage activities on a job site are not there. But you know, be, they'd be happy to do it, just need some additional support on how to get that done. So being able to support those firms as well. And I think that those two areas really give us the kind of demonstration that'll help us scale and show um, how uh, additional support, either from philanthropy and or from uh, government entities, um, can really make the difference. So um, we're coming, you know, kind of close to the end of our questions, but we do have a few forward looking questions. So I'm gonna uh, toss it over to you, Denise. 
Um, what do you see as the long-term impact of increasing the inclusivity of tr in contracting in affordable housing development? What, what is our North Star? What are we headed towards? What can we um, be hopeful about if we're increasing inclusivity in the supply chain of affordable housing development? When you asked that question, I immediately went to Tina's when Tina spoke yesterday about how affordable housing saved her life, I think just having that opportunity for us to recognize that that's what we do would allow us to really transform community, individual lives and legacies just moving forward for generations. I think it's an opportunity to break generational curses. Um, it's an opportunity to just see people thrive and so just having the opportunity just the chance could just open up so much for so many people because they just haven't had the chance i often hear like just give me a chance just like what we do with our interns just give me a chance and I, let me prove that i can do this and then we just see people grow i mean i had that opportunity starting out as an intern and look at where i am now and i think that's that's what we'll be able to get by opening up these doors and so from a financial standpoint, it is, so when Tina was able to say affordable housing changed her life by her getting in, it gave her a chance to be able to advance her family to the point where she was able to own a home and send her kids off to school. And if they choose not to go to school or they wanna open up a business, they have the opportunity to do that and continue in the same way that we see some of these other larger firms that have been around for decades. And I think that, at least for me, that's what I would like to, I look forward to seeing that happen. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, Denise and, and another panel, you know, we can each tell our story um, from, from whence we came and started out uh, yeah. in this field. <laughs> um, but the, what I get excited about is that we as an affordable housing field um, really have the potential to contribute to a larger conversation around what is the role of business and um, not just development, but you know, industries in being part of uh, solutions that not only house people, um, but create that economic pathway for communities. Mm -hmm. um, I started this conversation several years ago. I couldn't get much traction at all in most conversations. And I would talk about the fact that when you looked at uh, you know, some of the equity firms that we hire for our projects, there were no diverse people on those teams. Uh, when I looked at the legal firms that were um, you know, doing the work on these projects, there were few to no diverse people uh, on those teams. When I looked at the architect uh, who was the, doing the work on this project, there were no diverse people on those teams. And I was like, what does that say? about what it is that we're trying to accomplish in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, that system was perpetuating for me um, a level of exclusion from uh, you know, true dollars and wealth creation and economic opportunity. And here we were you know, spending five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars per unit, but for each of those dollars, how many of those dollars were really reaching the core of the people that whose lives we hope to change. Um, and so that is where I would like to see the future go in terms of what we think about as a field. Um, it's just not enough for me to house someone when we think about the power and the level and the number of resources that we have um, that can have an impact on a, a person, a family, and a community. Um, and it behooves us all not only to diversify the ranks of people who are within our organizations um, so that they are the people with the lived experience mm -hmm. who have um, benefited from uh, subsidized housing, but that we then identify and, uh, and try and come, you know, bring firms to the table that are owned by diverse people um, so that we're part of creating a different kind of ecosystem that doesn't move wealth from uh, the government to a majority white community. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, where I'm hoping that with a more inclusive procurement uh, set of policies, um, we can create a more inclusive set of results um, for those communities that need it most. Ooh. 
Are you tired yet? Girl, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. The, the, we, you know, we go, we're going to fight on, right? We're going to keep going. Um, so those are, you know, essentially mostly all of the questions that we had uh, for today. Um, are there any last questions from the audience? Are there any questions from our online audience? Seeing any questions from okay. online, thanks though. Well, we look forward to um, you each taking the step inside your organizations to get your DNI statements together, to rally your board and your colleagues and consider um, how you can contribute to making a more inclusive uh, procurement process. Uh, we look forward to your support of AB 2873 um, as it comes out. Uh, happy to take any feedback you have on that, but would love um, to get your support uh, on that bill so that we can get a baseline understanding as to where we are as a field. And with that, we'll let you out a little early. Denise, anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.